Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know who dialed up this weather, but I hope that you enjoyed our air dancer greeting you. And I want to welcome everyone back to the Institute of Contemporary Art here at UPenn for our spring 2019 opening. Um, to begin, I do want to acknowledge the extraordinary staff at ICA. And I know that the curators of the exhibitions tonight especially want me to acknowledge our chief installer, um, the wonderful artist Paul Swenbeck, as well as the wonderful artist and our registrar Kate Abercrombie, and all of the extraordinary artists who make up the ICA installation crew. It's really sort of magical what happens in our galleries in between exhibitions. And for making all of this possible, I want to acknowledge our very hardworking and generous board of overseers. For the exhibition Colored People Time, the second iteration Quotidian Pasts, we acknowledge the uh, partnership of the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, which has made all of the Colored People Time exhibition um, and coming publication possible. And uh, we also want to uh, thank our colleagues at the Penn Museum, the director Julian Siggers, Kate Quinn, uh, Duan Latimer, and Alex Pizzati. And of course, to thank Matthew Angelo Harrison, uh, co-curator Monique Scott, Jessica Silverman, and Beryl Belek Bevelek. And with Deborah Anzinger, An Unlikely Birth, I want to thank both Deborah Anzinger as well as Danielle Purfoy. And I think there's some information in your text about some upcoming programs. Please join us again tomorrow for a very interesting conversation around Unlikely Birth and mark your calendars for our upcoming free for all. So please help me welcome Danielle Rose King and Deborah Anzinger. Likely birth is concerned with issues urgently facing our civilization, which is those of the environment, the economy, human rights, and the rights of nature, um, as well as addressing their aggressors, i.e. capitalism and globalization. 
Uh, the exhibition considers the convergence of environmental and reproductive justice through an array of emblematic forms, textures, and materials, offering opportunities to reframe the catastrophes facing our present, whilst imagining openings for more equitable futures. So Deborah is based in Kingston, Jamaica, and works in painting, sculpture, and video at the intersection of black feminist, environmental, and geopolitical interrogation. She employs non-traditional materials such as living plants, Afro-kinky hair, and mirrors as openings to intimate and, alternate, and alternative aesthetics of being in the world. Her work has been exhibited at the National Gallery of Jamaica, the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora and Art in Brooklyn, the Royal West of England Academy in Bristol, the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas in Nassau City, Sargent's Daughters, Nicelle Beauchain uh, Gallery, and 47 Canal, all New York. Anne Zinger was a 2018 recipient of the Pollock Gras Krasner Grant, and she is the founder of New Local Space, a Kingston-based contemporary visual arts initiative founded as a place for artists to experiment with new ideas, collaborate with each other, and engage with the public. So I just wanted to thank Deborah for being such a fantastic collaborator and interlocutor for the past eight months as we've prepared this exhibition. Thank you also for joining me here tonight. Um, so I took, I suggested that we name your solo exhibition after this major painting. Um, I wondered if you, which is titled An Unlikely Birth, I wondered if you would be so kind as to talk a little bit about it, how you came to make it, and what it speaks to. Well, thanks, Daniela, for that really wonderful introduction, and for everybody, to everybody for coming here, and the wonderful staff that really helped the site-specific work become a reality. Um, uh, the title of the work, An Unlikely Birth, refer references... Um, the move that I made or the shift that I made with this work from the moment of conceiving of new ideas of self and one's own subjectivity to, um, to that then shifting one's understanding of how that in turn changes our understanding of the other. So the work created before this um, was concerned, mostly concerned with breaking down the hierarchies, as Daniela mentioned, between symbols of race and gender, um, materials, elements of the environment, nature, and the body. Whereas in this work, there is a focus, it, it, there is a move to focusing on reimagining um, the space that the black female body interacts with. Um, this work is the first work uh, of all the works exhibited um, upstairs it, in which I actually depict uh, the male body. Uh, most of the other works before this are, have indexes and references to the female body. Um, there are still references to non-human life and even just incorporation, um, the actual incorporation of non-human life in this. But for me, um, this is the first step for, um, of of bridging um, the male body also with nature in a way that has historically been um, projected onto the female body and how that um, understanding of the male body as part of nature can, can shift our understanding of masculinity and, um, and how we interact with, with nature. Yeah. So I'm gonna scroll through a couple more images um, that I think uh, sink into what you were just talking about in terms of thinking about gender binaries and like um, sort of um, racial descriptors, but also um, I should mention that the titling of your work is very um, important to the work and there's often a play on words. Um, is there anything you'd like to say about uh, fiction as a vessel for reality, potentially? Yeah. Um, Fiction as a vessel of reality for reality uh, was a moment where I thought about um, aesthetics, fictional works um, of art, uh, whether that be literature, whether that be visual art, as vectors really of transmitting ideas. Uh, I know oftentimes we, um, the ideas that we inherit, the legacies that we inherit with our understanding of how we fit fit within our environments are, are inherited through or transmitted through uh, 
fictional works. And uh, for me, I guess this was a play on words on, and referencing how that actually plays out in the rest of my work, not just this particular piece. Um, and I next wanted to ask you, um, well, just to mention that your work is full of indexes and abstract forms and signs. Uh, if you could briefly describe how they function within the work and perhaps um, maybe talk, hint at what the audience should be looking out for when they go upstairs. Um, it's important, I mean, we've spoken about, we've spoken about um, indexes, references to race and gender. Uh, for me, it's important that uh, rather than representation of the body, that I figured out a language that would convey subjecthood rather than representation. So I often use um, symbols that will reference um, race or reference gender rather than representing the body. Uh, it's important for me that while I, I have these references that the body is not presented in an easily consumable way. And so um, I will use uh, traits or markers, if you will, such as um, in this particular work, Afro kinky hair and in an unlikely birth, Afro kinky hair, which is a particular trait that references a particular ethnicity or a particular type of body. Um, you know, there will be body parts. So I, I use um, shifting from embodiment to disembodiment as a device to, to resist that consumption of the female body. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm so very much. excited to share. Oops, whoopsies. Um, to share the exhibition with everybody. Very excited about Meg's show also. Um, <laughs> and, and just to mention that, as Amy um, uh, said earlier, we do have a program tomorrow. So Deborah will be in conversation with Danielle Purifoy, um, who is a lawyer and geographer, who um, we're very excited will be joining us here. She's also contributed a really beautiful essay for the catalogue, which will be out in the early summer. Uh, I'll be moderating, um, but it will be an opportunity to talk about some of the expand on some of the ideas of the exhibition, as well as thinking about um, and talking through ideas of um, environmental um, racism and justice in regards to reproductive justice um, and the intersection of those um, sort of um, themes. So thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Kind of, yeah. I'm Meg Only. I'm an assistant curator here, and a lot of faces I recognize and know, so thank you so much for coming in. I just want to give a really quick shout out to Daniela and Deborah. It was amazing installing with two black women at the same time. It was really lovely, and I just really appreciate you guys. It was, I will say this is the chillest conversation on colonialism, <laughs> probably, you're going to hear, and that goes for both shows. <laughs> Is that fair to say? Um, so I've introduced myself, Meg Only. I'm always confused about introducing artists. I sat on this stage without introducing Arya Dean, so I'm not gonna make that mistake again. Um, whoops, next slide. Um, but I'm Meg Only, this is Monique Scott, and this is uh, Matthew Angelo Harrison, and we are here to present uh, the second chapter in Colored People Time. Colored People Time is an exhibition, experimental exhibition series that I'm working on over the course of the year, which uh, Amy uh, mentioned <laughs> that is so generously funded by Pew. Um, I just wanna give kind of a really quick shout out to our curatorial team and Amy for allowing me to undertake uh, such a project as well as Kate Craxton and Alex Klein who have given me a lot of advice on this project as well as Daniel Rose King who is always giving me good advice around this. Um, we've worked with the Penn Museum as Amy has, has mentioned but also with Matt and a lot with your gallery specifically uh, when thinking about <laughs> creating this work 
transporting this work. This has been kind of a year of a process getting it here. So shout out to Jessica Silverman Gallery as well as Kate and Paul. I just like to double up my thanks. Um, but the second chapter, I guess I should say maybe something about the first chapter, uh, Mundane Futures just recently closed. It was an exhibition that was thinking about how um, blackness is sort of tied consistently to this notion of projection. Um, colored people time is um, a vernacular phrase that is often used uh, sort of casually. And I wanted to use this as kind of a theoretical uh, way of thinking about our current time, how black people not only move through space, but specifically move through temporalities. I was encouraged by one of my thinking partners to not approach this from a place of uh, just having artists address the past, but that I actually had to consider um, how my practice as a curator, how the ICA as an institution, as well as sort of uh, more concretely, Penn has had this uh, long history and, and, and tie uh, to colonialism and how museum spaces are sort of tied to that. Um, when thinking about this show, the first person I thought of was Monique Scott, which we cannot establish how we met each other. Um, potentially someone that we both mentored. But I knew that Monique had been working with the Penn Museum's collection, and so you were the first person that I called to think through the history. The Penn Museum's collection was something that was totally open to us to access, um, and I really am grateful to them. You can actually contact them if you ever want to see any of the objects that are in the show to go see them as well as their archives. But I called you up. And I was like, hey, do you want to work on a project that is thinking about the Penn Museum as an institution and it's collecting history? And you said yes. Hello, yes. yes. <laughs> Will we speak in the microphone? Yes. Oh, is it on? Yeah. <laughs> I said hell yes. Um, I have been, I mean, as a black anthropologist, I have been very interested in the history of um, anthropological um, collecting practices and also have kind of a, a vexed relationship to anthropology, to the history of anthropology. Um, at the Penn Museum, um, again, big thanks to them for allowing me to do research for the past couple of years on the history of the African collections, um, which was a very, actually both mundane and powerful experience. The archives are vast and a lot of the the history of the African collections have not been processed. They have not been combed through. Um, and uh, I was very fortunate to do that. It was painful work sometimes, emotional work, um, but also a strange privilege to be able to read these documents, these correspondences, uh, witness this trafficking of, of ideas about African people and by association African artifacts, um, images of Africa, um, this, this trafficking of an objectification um, of, of, of Africa, people of African descent, um, that I think very much still has a legacy today. And um, the bestialization, objectification of African peoples in the past, I think, are one of the reasons why we are still having to argue why black lives matter today. Um, so the past has a currency in the present, for sure. This is obviously, we have a few more minutes left, but a very quick overview of what the show is. The years range between uh, 1930 to um, 1968 from the Penn Museum. There's a piece that actually dates back to 1909. Um, I would really recommend spending time with the show. There's a lot of extended wall labels and text to provide context that we're not gonna be able to provide tonight. But I wanted to kind of jump quickly to um, Matthew's work and Matt, I don't know if I told you how I first came across thinking about you in relationship to the show, but it was from the curator Grace Devigne. Um I told her I'd been thinking about going to the Penn Museum and she was like, well, you have to consider Matthew Angelo Harrison. And so to give people an idea of what they're gonna see upstairs, you've been working for the past, I don't know, like eight months or so here at the Penn Museum in relationship with uh, Monique and I photographing, and a huge shout out to Constance Mensch right there, who has done all of the photographs with Matt, um, multiple times coming back to the Penn Museum, um, locating objects. A lot of the objects are from Benin. Will you talk a little bit about your process and how you're thinking about um, 
I'm really interested in kind of the distortion that's occurring within the work and something that you and I've kind of talked about a lot is um, the way that you manipulate and think about Africa as this kind of broad idea within a black American imagination. That's her, wow. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna try to answer that as best I can. Um, yeah, so um, a part of my practice involves building machines, contemporary, like, to the time, so I use a lot of 3D printers, and uh, the material I choose is clay, ceramic, because it's a traditional art material, it has like this flexibility to it that I really like, and I think it's a good um, material, material to translate um, the abstraction of technology through. So um, when I think about my work in relationship to um, colonialism and race and identity building. Um, I kind of uh, find it an interesting place to put that in the, respons the responsibility in the hands of uh, technology or something that mediates me from that so that um, I'm the author but also I'm the, 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 the director of what's happening as opposed to like having exact control over how the clay is dispense and how it how it actually functions. So um, I kind of think of that's a good analogy to describe um, my relationship to understanding my history. So like I have um, only through a small like focal point can I truly understand the how I got here, how I exist, and um, how and where I'm going. So um, that's kind of I guess the, the, the more expressive explanation to the reason why I make the things the way that I do. Um, and can you, can, can you ask me, can you chop that up a little bit? Because that was a lot. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a great answer. No, okay. that's, a, that's a great answer. And I will say, like, I know we're on time right now. Oh, um, I was just getting started. Oh, this but. was, well, I will say, please join Matt and I over a drink as we chop this up yeah. later on. Um, this has been a year of conversations and it has been an absolute pleasure to bring people in and have a collaboration, like a true collaboration on this project, especially while doing this kind of large, um, this larger exhibition over the course of the year. Um, we do have two programs coming up. Um, we're going to be doing a film screening on uh, June 8th that is curated by the fantastic Mary Carmel Holmes. She paid me to say that. And uh, on the 19th, there will be a curator-led tour between Monique and I having a conversation around these ideas. Uh, please feel free to stop and chat with us. And thank you so much. And you didn't get rid of me. I'm doing a lot of things this year. <laughs> um, so tonight marks the 20th anniversary of our open video call. Um, 1999, I had to do math there very briefly on the uh, eve of Y2K. Um, we started doing open screenings of local Philadelphia artists, people with Philadelphia ties. Um, this is my third year of doing open video call. Um, we had 328 people apply this year. Um, that is a lot of videos coming through. It was an absolute pleasure to look through them. And I will just say that um, I feel like I fulfilled some curatorial dreams of purchasing an air dancer in celebration. So please see it outside. Thank you, Anthony. It was worth it. It was the best $500 that is not mine that I've ever spent. <laughs> Great craftsmanship. Thank you, Robert Cheney. Thank you, Anthony Elms. So tonight, um, I just want to announce the artists that are appearing in this year's open video call. Um, it is five artists, and I actually see the first one right here, so I'm going to announce him first, is Fred Schmidt Arnsalas? Arnalis. Do you mind standing up? Congrats, Fred. Uh, who could not be with us tonight, because uh, they're currently in a residency, is Cameron Granger, uh, born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, Erlen Giffard is not here right now, but is based here in Philadelphia as well. Um, M. Osley Dukin, who is also a Philadelphia-based artist, and as well as Ziyang Wu, who is right back here. 
Congratulations to you guys. OVC is located um, tonight. It's actually appearing in a special place. We will have it in the space that Kate had been installing it in the uh, ramp space that you can see. But it is also facing indoors and outdoors between um, Sansom Street. I like to battle uh, Urban Outfitters for best vinyl, so please check that out. And I will want to mention that on the 26th, we're going to be having a rush. Um, please show up with any video that is under 10 minutes that you would like to screen as part of open video call, we'll, we'll, we will be screening the first 10, I think I believed. Yes, the first 10, that's a long, hopefully it's under 10 minutes. Um, first 10 videos that arrive, I just have to say this, please PG-13 as much as possible for the art crowd. Um, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony Holmes. <laughs> And you don't actually hear much of me tonight. I'm just here to say that the Tony Conrad show is still unfolding. And a lot of what's happening over the summer is less about what I and the curatorial team really of Tony Conrad did, but trying to sort of extend him out and make him alive. So we've got the last two of our collaborations with Lightbox Film Center to show some of his video work and work of his collaborators. Um, let's see, May we will have his um, screenings. Uh, we will also have, in June, we will have Larry Seven, who is a collaborator of his, and that screening is com with, uh, also going to be alongside Jennifer Walsh, who's an Irish composer that he worked with a lot. And that's the beginning of a series of concerts we do with Ars Nova Workshop, which will also include um, uh, 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 Charlemagne Palestine, uh, MV Carbon, and Hunter Hunt Hendricks, who had worked with him while he was alive, as well as Eve Essex. And then also a performance with uh, Michael Morley, who's from a New Zealand group, the Dead Sea, and was in several exhibitions with Tony Conrad. We also have lectures with Orkan Telron, who teaches here at UPenn, who worked with Conrad as a student. Concert on Tuesday with Cobb Baird, and then many other activities as part of Free For All. And we also have a lecture with Corey Archangel, who is a collaborator and a student of Tony Conrad's as well. So it keeps unfolding in all the many ways that Tony Conrad kept trying to bring his community into his work, we're now bringing him into his community's work, sort of. And so, please come back early, often, for those and others. And, yeah, release the hounds. Thank you.